Allie, do you want to start? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm not seeing the slideshow on my screen. Oh, there it goes. Sorry. Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Klein. I am the digital content strategist for the Blanton Museum of Art. I've been in this role for almost three years, and in August of 2014, we decided to launch Snapchat as one of our social media channels. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, why Snapchat? First of all, the Blanton is located in Austin, Texas, and we're a university art museum. So already, a large part of our constituency is college students. Um, we have about 50,000 undergraduate and graduate students here on the 40 acres at UT Austin. And while we do get a lot of students who visit um, through classes, they're, they're sort of required to come, um, whether it's a teacher wanting to teach from the collection or they go on tours of the collection, um, we don't tend to actually advertise or market to university students. So that was one thing we were thinking about when we were trying to figure out how to reach students. Well, is there a way to reach them where they already are? And um, Snapchat seems like a natural fit um, with over 70% of the users between 13 to 25, and then even more staggering, 77% of college students use Snapchat daily. So it just seems like a really natural fit to reach students where they already were to let them know that the Blanton is here on campus, that we can sort of speak their language, and um, that we're a resource available for them outside of the classroom. One of the important things about Snapchat that we wanted to make sure was that it fit into our brand strategy. So at the Blanton, all of our social media channels are um, sort of tied in with our brand keywords. So the top four ones that we pulled out to sort of justify using Snapchat are visual, unexpected, cool, and worldly. And I just wanted to focus on the unexpected a little bit. I think, you know, people have preconceived notions about art museums, and we want to make sure that uh, the Blanton is an accessible space for everyone. And so with the unexpected aspect of this is we wanted college students to know that the Blanton could speak their language, that we weren't some sort of stuffy old art institution. And that's really what guided our posting strategy, which as you can see from these stamps, are sort of humorous, um, funny pop culture references. If you go to the next slide. So in August of 2014, we rolled out our Snapchat and sent um, a few snaps about selfies, ugly Renaissance babies, and the initial response was great. We had, um, 500 followers 18 days after our launch, which is pretty big for us as sort of a, a smaller um, art museum. We had someone who told us our stories make them laugh, an art history major who liked what we were doing. Um, and, you know, I think the response was really great right out of the, right out of the gate. Next slide. So some of the content that we put out on the Blanton's channels, it's really guided by, again, this sort of funny, cool, worldly voice. Um, we try to do a lot of pop, pop culture references. Um, we'll try to go into the galleries and I'll walk around and look at paintings and see how I can sort of have the, the figures in these artworks from hundreds of years ago talk in a 21st century voice. So, you know, there's a, a very lovely looking Spanish man in the galleries who reminded me of Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride. So, of course, you know, we wanted to do something like that. Um, we have a bridesmaids quote, um, you know, we're getting a little um, more kind of flirting with the line of appropriate, you know, referencing, um, you know, the face of a lovely lady in one painting. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we just try to make these relevant and funny and things that people sort of um, want to see injected into their daily life. And again, it's a way to bring art to people in a way that's relatable, um, that can reach college students where they are, bring them into the Blanton and not go through this sort of very typical, oh, I'm coming in to see the art and I want to, you know, see all these sort of jewel-like paintings. It's a way to really um, engage with a 21st century audience. Next slide. One of the things we noticed with Snapchat um, that was really interesting was people would start to screenshot it. So outside of our initial launch date, what we did was we put the word out that we were on Snapchat on Twitter Instagram, I think. And after that, we haven't really done any promotion of our account. What's happening is people are actually taking um, screenshots of our snaps and then putting them on their own social media channels, which is great. That means that, you know, we're getting this very authentic engagement from audiences that, you know, our content is good enough that they want to share it on their own personal networks. Um, and that's really been one of the major ways that we've grown our following. 
And I think one of my um, sort of favorite tweets about this is um, a museum professional named Lindsay Marolt tweeted that the Blanton Museum Snapchats make me want to visit in case anyone still doubts the value of museums having fun on social media. Um, I hadn't heard of Blanton Museum a year ago, but between Tumblr and their snaps, it's at the top of my to-visit list if I'm ever in Austin. And I think that really encapsulates our Snapchat strategy is, you know, while we are trying to reach these college students and bring them through the door, it's also a way for visitors who maybe don't live in Austin, who have never heard of the Blanton, can still experience art in the collection in a way that, um, you know, injects it into their everyday. Next slide. And just finally, I think the one thing I wanted to mention about Snapchat that we found is um, unlike typical social media networks, you don't have a ton of analytics to go off of. Um, unlike Facebook or Twitter, where they have these very robust, um, you know, reporting systems, Snapchat really gives you uh, a little information. You basically see how many people opened your snaps and how many people screenshotted them. Um, and you, you basically have a, a, a not a ton of information to go off of, right? So I think what we found is while we don't sort of look at our Snapchat analytics the same with the same intensity that we would for Facebook or uh, Twitter, I think there's still a lot of value in, in getting back to that anecdotal evidence of people, you know, posting our Snapchats on Twitter, posting them on Instagram. Um, and there's multiple ways to look at Snapchat. But if you're a very um, sort of analytics-driven institution, just know that if you do open a Snapchat account that it's you're maybe not going to have the sort of in-depth reporting um, that you would with an, another channel. Um, and I think that wraps it up for me, and I'll let the next presenter take it. Hello. Uh, my name is Michael Lahusky at the Georgia Museum of Art. And we are, at, of the four museums who are talking today about Snapchat, probably from the smallest um, market. Athens, Georgia is um, pretty much known as, as the uh, city for the University of Georgia. And our museum is an academic museum um, located on a university campus. So we have the pluses and minuses of that being on a university campus. Um, we can be difficult to locate for the average um, citizen or tourist to Athens. And students obviously have a lot of other things on their mind while they're on campus, like getting um, fed in between classes and uh, going to the uh, <clears throat> gym to work out and, and a whole lot of other things that surprisingly might keep them away from our you know, fantastic, wonderful institution. Um, the, we are also, though, the official state museum of art. Um, that gives us a little bit more autonomy. We don't operate just like a, a university or academic unit here at this large uh, state um, university. Uh, the building is very fairly large. The, uh, the, the left-hand side that you see right now, the, the gray colored part, is a really big new wing uh, that was added to the original, uh, well, not the original museum, but the building that was built in 96. So this big new wing um, houses our permanent collection and some of our smaller um, uh, temporary galleries. And then the original building, we have quite a bit of space with an auditorium and, and plenty of exhibitions for uh, many um, changing exhibitions throughout the year. So my interest is using social media to drive uh, visitation to the museum and awareness of the museum. Uh, especially on a college campus and, and uh, with the uh, lack of a marketing budget and um, really even the lack of a robust uh, staff to attend to this kind of thing, we find social media to be something that we absolutely have to engage if we're doing what we can with very little money. And uh, we would be negligent if we weren't using social media, you know, fairly robustly to try to reach everybody, but especially being on a college campus. So um, some of my next slides uh, will lead me to review um, some of the different ways that we've, we've tried out using Snapchat. Um, so we can go to the next one of those. Uh, this one um, uh, really jumps to a, a different topic that we're going to um, get to together later, but how are we going to get followers? Um, we've so far just gotten followers kind of um, organically. We promoted it a little bit on some of our other platforms. 
but now we are we're getting ready for the summer when we're going to have a whole all of our freshmen um, and transfer students that are going to be new to campus will be coming through campus this summer and and going through orientation. So we just produced this large band, uh, poster of our Snapchat or Snap code and um, used it for the first time just a week or two ago and stuck it out at, at Museum Mix, which is a, a sort of a, a more fun, uh, youth-oriented um, uh, social event with, with art, art viewing involved that we have at the museum. And we, a while back, bought our own button machine so that we can churn out buttons for practically any purpose. So we're going to uh, make a lot uh, of buttons with our snap code on those, and we'll be manning a table at a you know orientation um, kind of uh, resource expo on campus all summer long. We'll be doing multiple sessions of these over 20 sessions. So we'll be spending the summer reaching uh, hopefully a good percentage of the incoming freshmen who are obviously very excited. They've been accepted to the university. That's where they wanted to go to college. They can't probably they probably can't wait to get here later um, at the end of the summer. And they'll already this summer, if they start following us, start receiving some information about the fact that their campus has a art museum and it's an art museum that's already talking to them, that's already on a platform that they're using all the time. I think they're going to be really willing to uh, look at our snaps and to uh, and to digest those. Um, let's go to some slides now where we can show um, some of the ways we've used it. Um, I haven't just focused on our art assets. I've, I've kind of gone around the building, and this is maybe some of my advice for, for how to use Snapchat. I try to post, you know, not maybe not every day, but practically every day, uh, unless I'm tied up off camp, um, you know, out of the office or away from the museum and, and meetings or, or um, n not here, you know, not with a chance to get around into the building. But I like to wander around and just kind of find something to explore. We had a problem with this um, image on the left. This is a Bar uh, Beverly Pepper sculpture, and um, it's near. It, it got located. We've since decided it was a bad idea and moved it, but. For a while, it was by our front door, and believe it or not, there was a day when we found a wet umbrella <laughs> parked inside the base of this uh, sculpture. Um, so, um, you know, we had had an umbrella stand in, inside the lobby, and so the, these are two consecutive posts that I put on Snapchat. Uh, they, they're actually videos, but whether they're still a video doesn't really matter for these. Um, so uh, it's just sort of exploring our space, and, and the art ends up being part of the conversation. Let's go to another slide. And um, when I'm off campus, I'm sometimes involved in, uh, definitely involved in museum work, and I've managed to find ways to tie that into some kind of a legitimate post to our uh, our own um, account. So I was in Atlanta, where the tourism industry was presenting a check to the governor of the state, representing the amount of money. The tourism um, brings to the state, and I put this post um, up there. It was a video, and it got picked up by the Atlanta story. So um, that's just an example of of traveling outside of our own museum and still finding ways to post. I was at the High Museum and at the Museum of Design Atlanta. Other other arts institutions or entities, especially if they're for, you know, visual art, and especially if they offer any kind of free programming, uh, the, these are things that I also want to promote. It, it enhances our status as um, kind of a legitimate source of information about art in Georgia. Since we're the official state museum of art, I feel that if we're promoting the High Museum of Art or a community art center in a smaller city, or any other art institution that what we're what we're doing is we're trying to talk about you know museums museums matter art art matters people should do this you know we're trying to get people to understand that they need to put them si themselves inside these these museums and the snaps I did at the high museum which is what you see right now uh, I've, I've featured a lot of the art very short snaps and um, uh, 
it, they got a lot of click throughs and this, it, what I like to do is occasionally do a longer story where about maybe 10 to 15 or or even 20 uh, very short snaps, still images mostly, up for two seconds or so. Um, when you go and you look at that analytic um, uh, amount, the, the basic amount of analytical information that you can get from Snapchat, if you look about 24 hours later from when you had posted all of these, you can see how many people viewed them. And it can be instructed to look and, and look through a longer uh, series of those individual snaps that kind of comprised you know, taken as a whole, your story. And it's been gratifying to look and see that people have more or less followed our story to the end. And so that's one, one way that I think you can measure some of this. Uh, just, you know, trying to be magnanimous and trying to promote other arts institutions is what, we, is what we also do. So just by putting up this little glimpse of how uh, the SNAP code at the Museum of Design Atlanta was being um, presented in their lobby space is, is just an opportunity for other people to also follow them. Um, let's look at some other slides. We do um, engage in some of the fun um, kind of you know references. This isn't exactly a super current kind of um, cultural meme of <laughs> Goldilocks, but we do have decorative arts at the museum. It can be pretty boring to me, and it's fun just to go in there and look at it and think of a way to reinterpret or, or offer a different interpretation. I think that's what all of us are doing in an art museum or, or, or other sorts of museums as well, is that we are um, our educational staff, our curatorial staff, they are mostly helping to interpret the work for our visitors and provide context and even Snapchat can be doing that. And it's good on Snapchat to respond to shared experiences, things that are going on, and so one would be the weather. These are two of the posts that I put up that just kind of reference you know, weather as we were experiencing it in February and it was like spring in February and then there was a really, really windy day. Um, one idea that I've experimented with is doing, basically sharing an exhibition with somebody by showing um, all of the all of the works in the exhibition, but you're not showing it to them in a way that that can really um, be a stand-in for coming to the museum and seeing it in person. This was a fairly small exhibition of, of, of face jugs, and just and they were behind a glass case, so I couldn't really get good images of them anyway. But just by getting in real close and putting up little one-second um, posts of face jugs, and then I think it concluded with a little longer still image that said, you know, face jugs. Um, that's that's one one way to kind of compress and tell a story of what's going on inside your building that maybe can induce somebody to want to come and see it in person. I even did this in our shop. I wandered around the shop and just did a whole bunch of very quick images of items that are for sale. And that that got viewed just as thoroughly as, a, as some of our other, you know, seemingly more compelling posts. And when it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on, I'll just do a shot like this that just um, reminds people that we are posting every day, we're talking to them, this is a museum for them. Instead of honing in on our artworks, instead of coming in within the frame of a painting, I think that my use of Snapchat and imagery about this museum in general has pulled back a little bit, has has maybe shown a little bit more the context. This is where you would be if you would get yourself into this building. This is the place. This is what happens here. There's a lot of variety of things that happen here. Being on a college campus, we might end up with school kids coming through here or university students playing, um, you know, vibraphone in the lobby or a choral group. A kid comes and plays his bagpipe in the sculpture garden. There's always a way to find something to show, some kind of visual, um, you know, evidence that people are engaged. And I want other, I want people to see that, so that they, that they know that they're welcome here. 
And ideally, I'd like them to see people that look like themselves. I think I have just a couple more slides. Here's one where I've, I've also realized that, yeah, this is not Tumblr, um, and um, this is not Instagram, this platform isn't. But I started thinking, why, why can't we also just do elegant or beautiful photographs just because it's Snapchat? It doesn't necessarily have to have um, – you know, Google eyes and uh, squiggles and um, and and um, tilted graphics and that kind of thing all over it to still be compelling. It could be that if you're going through a whole lot of Snapchat um, content and then you you land to some fairly high caliber visual imagery, it, it it's worth a try and it's something that I've been doing a little bit more of instead of junking it up. So this one was just posted without comment. I, it, I just happened to see this in our vault. I have no idea. I, I, I don't even know who to attribute this work to. So it's just easier for me to just throw it out there as a beautiful image and, and not even worry about naming it or describing it. Um, this was at the Museum Mix event. And um, the Blanton, um, as we just heard from Allie, has had the um, – the good experience of finding some of their you know snaps of their screenshots have shown up on other people's social media, and so there's this wonderful echo effect. Um, I don't know that we've seen that because maybe some of our snaps are not all that um, uh, juicy and uh, fun that way. But here here was a good outcome. I was going around at this museum mix and and asking college age people if I could take their picture. And I'd let them know, hey, this is just going to be on Snapchat. It'll be gone in 24 hours. Do you want to set your drink down, or you know? And they, and they, you know, everyone said yes. I'd take their pictures. And then these two guys came up to me, and they said, hey, are you the guy that's doing the Snapchat for the museum? Uh, can we get our picture on the the museum Snapchat? So to me, that was. Um, that was a success when you have your the audience that we're trying to reach wanting to be and thinking that there's some kind of a you know benefit because of course they can put up their own Snapchat post. So I think that was a a sign of success for us. The the big Snap code was on display in the lobby during this event with DJs and um, and that was also a week from last Thursday. It was the day that Prince passed away. Our DJs um, were playing vinyl that day, and they put on this uh, seven-inch of Purple Rain. And one of my interns was helping that day, and she was the one that told me that there was a Purple Rain Snapchat filter. So uh, I hadn't even realized that. So this is my my last example of some of our posts, and um, just a way that um, things can knit together sometimes. Hi, this is Lucy from LACMA, um, and I created this presentation, The Anatomy of a Snapchat, to talk about specifically from a beginner's point of view, what is Snapchat and how to use it. Um, thank you. Somebody loves our snaps. That's, that's awesome to hear. Um, I, you know, this is just a cartoon I came across on Snap on uh, Facebook and it resonated with me. It looks like another case of someone over 40 trying to understand Snapchat and his head has just exploded. But it's actually not all that mysterious. It's um, just like any other social media platform, it takes a minute to learn the ins and outs and the different um, functionality available there. But um, once, once you get it down, um, you can really have a lot of fun with it and really do a lot of really cool stuff. So uh, you can go to the next slide, slide Stephanie. Um, we might be most, um, one of our most popular snaps this year was a full rendition of Bohemian Rhapsody on our Snapchat. This was a video in the presentation, but um, we won't have time to play it for you today. But um, again, lack of Snapchat strategy sort of yields uh, to the demographic of the channel, which is, um, a younger demographic, so in order to reach those people, we try to, you know, tie in pop culture references and uh, memes and quotes and song lyrics and stuff like that. Um, so you can move on. I'm going to kind of go quickly through this beginning part of the presentation um, because 
a lot of it has already been covered by my two previous speakers. But um, so what's the deal with Snapchat? I have some stats here. Um, it's the top. It's in the top 13 of U.S. apps downloaded overall, and it's often the top three most downloaded photo and video apps. Um, so as you can see, it's a very popular platform, especially among millennials and younger audiences. So um, it's another way for LACMA to reach an audience that maybe some of the traditional channels don't reach because they view a little bit older. Um, and people that use Snapchat use it so frequently that um, we've seen incredible engagement on the channel. So it's really wonderful for LACMA to be part of um, a channel that gives that has so much um, range and so much reach. So if we go to the next slide, I sort of started to outline what Snapchat looks like. On the left side, there is um, the direct messages side. So as they say, it goes down in the DM. Um, we get a lot of direct messages from our followers. Um, people send us props. People send us um, thank yous and things that they're saying they love our snaps. They sometimes suggest songs or uh, memes that we should cover. Sometimes I do listen to them. And most of the time we get a lot of direct messages that are just totally un irrelevant. And so I look at them, but um, I try to read all of our direct messages, but it's not always possible. But um, I try. So the other two are uh, just slides explaining what the screen looks like and how to send a snap and what you can do with it. You can send a geo filter, you can add emojis and texts and drawings on top of your snap. So um, yeah, the next slide tells you that um, my story is the top thing. On, so that's the, the, the part of the platform that we use, that everyone uses basically to broadcast um, snaps to all of our followers. Um, and then we measure our um, success on Snapchat by views and screenshots. So we get um, about 80,000 views per story now. We keep growing and we're really happy with our engagement numbers. Um, we have a little over 180,000 followers right now, which means that we're almost at a 50% um, impressions rate, which is extremely high compared to other social media channels. So we're super happy about the, um, the strength of the channel and the engagement that we get there. Um, we get between 500 and 1,500 screenshots per story, um, depending. I think our highest was 3,300 for Bohemian Rhapsody, which included about 30, 30, 30 to 35 different snaps covering the whole song. So it was kind of fun. Um, and then local story, the Los Angeles story is something that we um, sometimes feed into. We try to um, showcase some of our events on um, the Los Angeles story whenever possible. Um, so there was a question that popped up a little bit ago about whether we do custom geo filters. And we have tried that once. Um, it worked out very well, so we will be doing that in the future. But for our teen night event at LACMA, we had about 3,000 teenagers come to a free program at the museum where they had a DJ and they were dancing. and. Um, we did a custom geo filter for that evening, and it was hugely popular. Kids were really excited about it, and it was featured on the LA story. Um, so, very exciting. Um, so, again, we are very fortunate to have our own geo filter at LACMA. When Snapchat first launched geo filters, they approached LACMA and said, you know, we want the museum to have its own geo filter, and that way visitors can you know, snap from the museum and share, um, you know, the fact that they're at LACMA and LACMA chose the logo, which works really well. It's, it's not in the way too much. It's pretty, um, it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. So it's really cool that we get to brand all of our snaps using the geo filter. Um, it's fun. It's funny. Like I already said, um, these are just kind of our basic, um, tenets of our Snapchat strategy. It, um, and one of the goals is to lower the intimidation factor of art. So we want people to be able to relate to artworks and relate to our collection. And um, so that demographic that we have been talking about really resonates, or the, the strategy that we use really resonates with that demographic. So 
here's a couple more examples of some of our um, snaps we've done recently. Custom geofilters cost money, correct? Yes. So there are event-based geofilters that um, Snapchat has recently announced that do cost money. They're relatively affordable, though. So um, I'd encourage people to look into it if you're interested in doing it for an event or a short period of time. They charge by the t amount of time you do and the um, the range of the geolocation. So it's kind of based on that, but it's not that expensive. I think ours that we did for T night was like seventy five dollars. As far as an overall custom geo filter that's permanent, I know that's pretty expensive, and I'm not sure what Snapchat's doing with it now. Like I said, we're kind of grandfathered in with our own logo um, because Snapchat approached us when geo filters were first announced. So, um, but yeah, we try to have a lot of fun with our snaps um, and have a lot of fun with our collection. Um, you can move on to the next slide. We get a lot of great feedback. So this is some older stuff that I haven't had a chance to update yet, but this is um, pretty much along the lines of what people tend to say about our account. Um, they're sharing their, um, they're sharing screenshots of our snaps and they're telling people to follow us and that's pretty much how we organically gained a huge audience on Snapchat by word of mouth and other people talking about how much they like our account and how much they enjoy our snaps. So um, it's really great to see that positive feedback and it always gives me extra special or like an extra um, motivating factor, I guess. I, I love to see people's reactions to what we post and um, it's really nice to have support from the community and just know that we're doing something right. So um, we've also gotten a lot of great press for our Snapchat. Um, we've been featured in many, many different um, publications. Uh, these are some quotes from Vanity Fair, the New York Observer, and Huffington Post. Um, we So that's another way we've gained our following is through press and through um, people paying attention via uh, these, public, these different publications. And um, in the next slide, I linked to a bunch of other ones. Um, so another example of our strategy, stop trying to make fetch happen, is a quote from Mean Girls. So um, again, relating our collection to contemporary pop culture and just having a lighthearted, fun approach to it. And that's pretty much it, except that we won the Webby Award last week, which I'm super excited about. Um, <laughs> we submitted during the social, culture, and lifestyle um, category, and we were up against the Metropolitan Museum of Art Instagram, the Museum of Modern Art in New York Instagram. We were up against Casemade, Snapchat, uh, Discover page, and the Refinery29 Facebook page, and we won the category and we're so excited that um, this is just another um, accolade that we're super thrilled to um, get acknowledgement for our work and it's just it's a lot of fun so um, that's that's all I have to say for now but I'm looking forward to answering some of the questions towards the end of the, the webinar great um... <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Lucy. This is Abraham Ritchie at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Um, so I think uh, my colleagues have definitely delved into um, some of the audience uh, demographics and stats um, for why Snapchat. So I don't think um, I need to go over it, but I did on a basic level just want to um, sort of uh, point to the fact that Snapchat is definitely um, – leading the pack in terms of up and coming social media platforms. Um, so I would strongly um, urge people to consider uh, at least establishing a presence there so that you have your preferred username and account established um, and then um, figure out how to manage um, what your activity will be and, and your brand uh, there. It definitely seems to me that it's going to be a platform that we see, uh, we see grow into the future. Um, so if you want to click to the next slide. 
Um, and I also wanted to highlight the fact that Snapchat is um, really still an unfiltered, unmediated social network. There's no, as far as I know, um, algorithm uh, separating your content from your audience. And this is um, different than Facebook, and it's different than Instagram, where um, that filtering algorithm really does um, deeply and strongly affect how far um, your content is reaching and how many people it's um, being seen by. Um, just as anecdotal uh, evidence, um, I posted uh, something, I posted a photo to Instagram yesterday about a book signing that we had. It got nine likes. We have an audience of over 36,000 and the post before that had gotten over 600 likes. So, I mean, to me, that just says that something artificial is going on. Um, I don't think it was, I mean, we, you, can, you can take a look at our Instagram and see if you think it was the content or if you think it's an algorithm based on all the stats there. But um, more and more, we're seeing these filtering algorithms having a dramatic impact on our social media work, um, and Snapchat is still unfiltered. Um, also wanted to highlight the fact that it's, it's a messaging service, and people use it like they would use a text message, iMessage, or anything. Um, in the days before Snapchat, it really did, the idea of the platform really did exist as, um, you know, a photo that you would drop into a photo editor and scribble on. Um, I still have those apps on my phone and, you know, you just uh, scribble on a photo and then send it to your friend versus via text message or via iMessage. So Snapchat is the really next, the next generation of that logic and that production. Um, and, uh, and people use it like text messages. So it's a very, very powerful tool um, that um, people have in their pocket. Um, you can skip to the next slide. Um, so uh, the decision then is uh, ways to snap. Um, and I'm not going to um, really presume to, to uh, make a overall arching judgment for you know how you guys should use it. Um, if you want to use it, um, find, I would say find an approach that fits with your museum voice and brand. Um, other museums' approaches may not be suitable for your organization. Um, and we've had a couple questions come up, up about this already um, in the presentation. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's worth sort of relaying this anecdote um, since it's um, – and we even have some people on the line. So um, in 2014, Hyperallergic um, published this big article about the first museums on Snapchat and featured um, you know, all of LACMA's great work. Um, and they mentioned the Blanton, too. Um, and we just joined Snapchat at that point in the fall of 2014. Um, we were definitely one of the early adopters. I don't know, you know, if we were the first or, I mean, I definitely know we weren't the first, but we were, you know, uh, some of the early adopters on. And, um, you know, I was very excited to see that, you know, this was going to be sort of a viable platform. So I sent this off to um, our museum director and um, I sent off the hyperallergic article and a couple examples of LACMA's slide and um, Blanton's and, and their snaps and, um, you know, asked for input. I, I, you know, I did ask you know, is this, uh, you know, content strategy that we can pursue? And um, I was essentially told no, um, it wasn't appropriate for our museum's outlook, um, and it wasn't um, appropriate for the art and the artists that we maintain relationships with. So, um, so we've been uh, sort of um, We've been consciously pursuing a different path than um, both LACMA and Blanton. Um, I will say at times it does feel a little bit like a salmon swimming upstream. Um, it does feel like we're working against the uh, logic of the platform to a degree. So, um, so that's been a challenge. Um, Snapchat does have a younger audience, as everyone has mentioned, and its tech is, you know, more personal and direct, as I've highlighted. But I think, um, you know, it's also possible to find a content um, strategy that really fits with your museum and your and your audiences, um, and they'll appreciate it for you. You know, um, I include the snap that was just a nice compliment for uh to us from from one of our followers that just said you know um we i like the art um uh and so you know maybe uh you know if your approach sort of eliminates the option to have 
um, the art sort of be act in a humorous way, um, there are other possibilities. Um, so we can skip to the next slide. Um, so these are just um, some some ways, some sort of you know brainstorm starter ideas of about ways to snap. Um, humor is always a great uh, great idea. Puns, uh, visual jokes, insider jokes. This is really a platform where art history humor can take off if you want it to do that. Um, I think um, Blanton and Ali do a great job at that too. Pop culture references. LACMA uh, does a you know phenomenal job at that, and they uh, definitely deserve all the credit that they get around there. And then funny things um, that happen around the building and the grounds too. And I think uh, Georgia Museum might have alluded to this a little bit. Um, and uh, and that's just, you know, providing that inside look about, at things that are happening. And since Snapchat is an ephemeral platform, it's the perfect place for shots that are um, unplanned, imperfect, spontaneous, unpolished, you know, all those things that you would want to see um, on a more permanent medium are not factors on Snapchat. Um, you know, uh, I'm using this term great shots in quotes just because um, photos of your building, um, especially if you're using the platform to build awareness, um, are really likely new to your audience. I'm always, um, I'm always surprised and uh, constantly reminding myself that audiences don't necessarily translate platform to platform to platform. Um, they do tend to, at least in our experience, tend to remain um, connected to one platform over others. So, um, so using those um, sorts of, you know, great shots of your build building um, are um, are really uh, potential, you know, content uh, blocks for you to build. Um, your staff is a huge resource. Uh, short clips, interviews with staff, um, if you can get them to demo things, that's been good. Um, skits, we actually haven't done anything on that, but um, I've seen a lot of you know good examples out there. Um, tour clips, um, really fun too, um, especially if it's uh, you know an artist giving a tour or a major exhibition that has a you know uh, a uh, wide um, awareness campaign along with it. Um, all this really makes your museum more personal um, and more personable, um, which is, you know, part of one of the main strategies or uh, goals rather of why the MCA is on Snapchat and why uh, some of the other museums are too. I've heard that echoed. Um, behind the scenes uh, shots are, are always good for, you know, whichever platform and they're especially good on Snapchat because, you know, the content vanishes. So there might be, you know, a little bit more leeway with um, getting your teams to cooperate uh, and showing some of those um, not so perfect moments of the museum that people want to see. But I've found that staff is sometimes reluctant to um, show things that are less than 100% polished. Um, so my snap at the right is just, you know, just a all quiet before uh, opening. It's one of the classic, um, this is, the stairway is our hands down most photograph moment. So um, just, you know, sort of having that quiet moment before the museum opens. Um, and we can skip to the next slide. Um, and then continuing on ways to snap, um, I uh, recommend um, we're a contemporary art museum. So um, our exhibitions, we have no permanent um, exhibitions on view. We have no, we have a permanent collection, but it's not on permanent view. So um, we're always rotating exhibitions. Everything's constantly, constantly changing. So it's been um, somewhat challenging to find something that is recognizable as the MCA. Um, but I've gone with our Thomas uh, Schutte sculptures at Wright that also become um, characters or, or stand-ins, you know, um, in our uh, in our you know uh, snap uh, narrative, um, so uh, I use these characters again and again based on what uh, whatever um, you know is sort of pertinent. Um, so the example here is uh, the NFL draft was going on in Chicago uh, last week. Um, it was huge news. You can see they lit up the downtown skyscrapers a little bit over the top, one might say, but you know. Um, and then, you know, to, just to add to that, I, you know, took a shot of, of the guys and then just, you know, connected um, it into the NFL draft since that was huge Chicago news. Um, and that follows into my next sort of 
point, um, changes in season, changes in weather, um, major events, you know, I think you're hearing that too with, you know, weather at Georgia, at the Georgia Museum, it was the same thing here. We had, we've been having a terribly cold spring. So, um, you know, that's a great sort of point to a uh, point of resonance with your uh, community and audience. Um, and then major events, um, local and national, are all good opportunities. Um, Lucy mentioned Prince's death um, and that sort of thing, too. Um, I, uh, you can use the My Story function to serialize your um, snaps into a narrative. Um, the Bohemian Rhapsody one was great. Um, she did it with the Prince lyrics, too, which is great. Um, we've done it with you know quick tours of things, and it's um, actually a content strategy I'm uh, excited to build uh, more around. Um, and then um, also, of course, those um, showing the process uh, uh, looks. Um, you can demonstrate how to um, how installations happen, uh, artists working on things in live and real time. This is a big sort of priority for us because um, we're all about you know living our artists and connecting with um, connecting with the creative process. So that's a really important um, goal for us. So um, we can move to the next slide. Um, and then, uh, so thinking about your audiences, um, and this somewhat relates to, to analytics. I didn't, uh, I didn't include an analytics slide in here since um, I knew other people would go into it. Analytics are, of course, very, very tricky on Snapchat um, right now. That um, uh, it's it's really sort of a time crunch issue as to how much tracking we uh, I do on Snapchat. Um, so I've sort of reached an understanding with. Um, our team here that we're um, we're participating in the platform. We're very active, and um, when tracking analytics becomes uh, less time consuming, we'll definitely do that. I try to do it as much as possible as I can anyway. Um, it's not exactly a perfect science um, given the current tech situation. Our our team understands that and understands um, why it, uh, you know its importance nonetheless. Um, so in terms of audiences, um, I recommend uh, participating in a larger Snapchat ecosystem, particularly since on the recent update, they've added um, usernames to your local uh, community stories. So that even increases your ability to um, to uh, to connect with a larger audience that's also in your own um, location. Um, so I I recommend you know sharing um, typically via my story. Um, you can engage your super fans with um, snaps just for them if you have the time. That really builds a relationship very quickly and creates a very quick um, sense of intimacy. Um, it also means that they feel like they can snap to you at any point, um, which has been um, um, sort of an unexpected um, flip of that, and I've gotten snaps coming into me at all times of the night. Um, so um, it's a great, it's great potentiality. It can uh, even go too far. Um, and then join your community through posting to your city stories. Um, it's a great opportunity for your cities to go citywide, or for your stories to go citywide. Excuse me. Um, and uh, and you might even see yourself. Um, this is uh, these are two snaps of Mr. T visiting at the MCA um, because it's kind of a long story, but he's actually featured in one of the artworks on view. So he came by to visit himself in the artworks. Um, it was a great opportunity. I actually am featured in that lower left image at far left talking to him. So I was flipping through our local story and ended up seeing, uh, seeing myself, which was uh, unexpected. Um, but uh, this is just to demonstrate how um, your your uh, institution can um, get into that local story and can have that sort of wider um, wider exposure. Um, and so uh, with that, that's uh, the conclusion of uh, my presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Um, we were going to have a conversation, but we're running a little low on time. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I want to open it up to questions from our audience. Um, we've already received some questions, so we'll start with those first. Um, the first, can you all four of you first just tell the audience um, what year you started your Snapchat account? 
Uh, Allie at the Blanton here. Um, we started ours in 2014. Michael at Georgia Museum of Art. Uh, we started right around the time of that hyperallergic article. Uh, I believe that was uh, also 2014. Abraham at the MCA. Oh, uh, sorry, we started ours in um, 2014 as well. Lucy, did you Go start ahead, Lucy. in 2014 as well? Oh, yeah, Lackmore started in 2014 as well. Okay. Um, so we've gotten a few questions about how do you approach image rights on this platform. Um, have you seen any need to credit the works that you're posting? I can I could jump in on that because as a contemporary art museum, we definitely have uh, copyright concerns. Um, so my approach has been even though the content vanishes, we're still publishing that content. Um, so we abide by um, the image rights approach that we would do for any other thing. Um, that said, we there's just simply not enough space to credit an artist and a title on every single snap that we publish. So we typically do not include that type of tombstone information, but we would, um, we would not um, snap things that are protected by copyright um, or that artists have expressed that they do not want photographed. And uh, yeah, Allie and Blanton here again. We um, we tend to stick to old master paintings since those are the works in our collection that um, were free and clear to use, obviously. Um, so I, you know, I think it's a it depends on your museum and how sort of strict they are with their image rights. I mean, um, I get a lot of leeway to post images sort of under the blanket kind of fair use um, term. So you know, I think like Abraham said, it depends on your institution and and how strict or or not strict you are on your social media channels in general with that. That's yeah, Ali, LACMA is similar too, with the fair use um, being kind of the primary uh, prevalent way that we're thinking about posting on across social media channels. Um, I do try to stick with public domain as much as possible, and at LACMA we're fortunate to have an encyclopedic collection, so we try to feature different parts of our collection, different cultures on Snapchat. And as far as crediting is concerned, occasionally I like to try to like tweet about similar about the images or put them on Facebook um, around the same time that I'm snapping, so that if people do follow us on multiple channels, they'll see more information about each artwork if they want to, basically. But everything is available on our website, so I just kind of assume that people can look into more information if they're interested. Um, so our next question has to do with upper level management. Um, some people want to know if you got buy-in from the director or any type of museum leadership before you started, or did you just start the ground running with experimentation, or um, and do you get any pushback from other museum staff and leadership, in particular if you want to post more irreverent posts? Um, at the Georgia Museum of Art, uh, uh, we're, we are very small. We work, uh, everybody works together. I work very closely with our director of communications who sort of by extension because of her authority gives me, um, you know, uh, pretty much free reign when it comes to how to manage this just out of, uh, out of pure trust. Uh, I did just uh, present um, to our board of advisors and our director about uh, how we are using social media and shared it. So, just by being transparent um, internally, I think that uh, everybody supports what it is that we're doing and understands that we're, we're trying to do, the, do right by the institution. As far as the University of Georgia uh, that uh, we are a unit of, there is, um, a, a, you know, there are quite a few units that are also in Snapchat. I think most of them are more um, floundering than they are, um, you know, definitive about how to best use the platform as it is. So right now we're we're possibly a leader within our within our um university as to what I would call a best practices and so far we have not really been asked to account or explain what it is that we're up to, but we are not careless in the least. Um, so our next question is does your museum add back everyone who adds you? Um, this is Allie at the Blanton. 
Uh, we do. We add back everyone. Um, and <laughs> luckily, unlike LACMA, we don't have, you know, 180,000 followers to count through, but that's how we know how many people followed us is when, whenever someone follows us on Snapchat, we add them back. And then um, every so often I'll go through and just honestly hand count <laughs> how many people there are. Um, and that's how we find out our follower numbers. At LACMA, we don't follow back just because of the volume of followers that we do have. Um, I follow uh, some of the ones that are listed as like the best Snapchat accounts to follow so that I have a reference when I watch their snaps. I can see, you know, maybe we want to emulate that in some way and like just get ideas from some other Snapchat influencer accounts. Um, I also look at um, some of our local influencers, if there's um, someone on YouTube or someone I've met through different um, influencer events at WACMA that is on Snapchat, then I follow them to see what they're up to in the Los Angeles area to see, you know, what we might be able to collaborate on or something like that. But, um, no, we don't follow back in general. Um, so a few people are wondering how much time per week um, do all of you spend on Snapchat content? Um, you know, some people only have maybe one social media person. Do you think it's manageable for one person to be able to handle Snapchat along with the other social media feeds that they're already on? This is Ali. Well, I have. Um, <laughs> Go sorry. ahead. Um, I can just speak to that since I am the only social media person here at the museum. Um, when we started, we were trying to post daily. And now, you know, just because there's so many other things on my plate, we, we don't post as much. We post maybe a couple times a month instead. But I really think that because Snapchat is so ephemeral and stories disappear, you know, not posting as frequently as you would on a normal sort of um, published platform, it, it's not as apparent. So um, you can still have just as much impact on people who have added you, even if you don't post daily. I think that's one of the nice things about the platform. And I was just going to echo Allie. This is Abraham at the MCA Chicago. Um, uh, I'm the only person running social media. So, um, you know, in the past, so it is doable as sort of a one person, um, you know, organization. Um, I, you know, my sort of goal for each week is um, two to five posts, um, at least, uh, you know, some weeks when we're opening up a major exhibition like we were um, a couple weeks ago, it doesn't happen. Um, so, I mean, I would echo Allie that, you know, it's great to have a presence there since it is ephemeral not posting is not the end of the world. It's not like Twitter where you can look back through a timeline and see that there are a bunch of gaps or like Facebook where if you don't post for a day, um, you probably get penalized for it too. So um, so that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, I'll echo Abraham too. This is Lucy at LACMA. I'm the only social media manager at LACMA, so I can attest to that. Um, not being able to post daily, although I would love to. I aim for two to three times a week. I was aiming for two to five times a week, but just recently it just hasn't been doable. So two to three times a week is our target. And I usually reach that. And um, as as we've seen, our snaps are successful. And I think people enjoy the frequency, as, at least to be able to count on us at least once a week to see something that we um, put on our Snapchat. I will say, too, that managing all social media accounts as one person is a challenge, but um, I do brainstorm with, our, with my colleagues in communications and marketing and try to work together as much as possible when, um, you know, with the limited resources that I have, I try to really um, capitalize on the other people that um, I work with and, you know, ask interns and younger staff members, what's going on in pop culture, and things like that. So um, it's not just me um, 100% of the time. I do really have to thank my colleagues and everybody for the support that they give um, to social media internally. So, but it's I would cool like to just comment thing. on um, on the frequency of posting. Uh, if you're not going to – I would say to concentrate more on consistency than um, whatever the actual frequency is – and your users would probably get used to that, and so will you, and it would kind of keep you from going nuts. I mean, I think it's – I'm not planning out these long, elaborate um, posts that Lucy often does, so they don't take that much time for me to do if I'm just going to go down and do like three snaps in a day. And I don't care if they're all crunched together, shot 
uh, one after the other because that's the way people are going to experience them anyway when they find them later. So there's no need to space them out like you might be trying to do on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. I think you can just go down there and you know squeeze some snaps out and be done with it for the day. And at least for me, that makes that makes me feel that we are making an effort to stay engaged with the platform, and um, I don't sweat it if we miss a day, but a day or two, but uh, try to just keep it consistent. And I think w- whatever is consistent for your institution is probably good enough for your users. Um, and this is Abraham. I'd just jump in and say I probably spend about uh, maybe an hour each week uh, doing this. I haven't. I don't think I've gone over that except for maybe a couple times. Um, but I would. I do. I do want to say I'm. You know, actively reevaluating that as we see. You know, filtering algorithms kick up on Instagram and Facebook, and as I see more success and more audience on Snapchat, um, I'm definitely going to be reconsidering the amount of time that I spend on it, the amount of content that gets produced um, despite the ephemerality um, because the platform is proving itself and is proving itself to be more effective and more popular moving forward. So I'm, you know, that's the current situation. I'm actively considering, you know, do I need to bump that up? And this is something that, you know, I, I think about constantly is what is the mix of, of time spent on each platform producing content to keep it live, to keep it viable, and is that the right mix? Um, and in my opinion, the, the Snapchat mix is going to go up. Um, so really quickly, because we're running out of time, I'm going to read out one last question. Um, have any of you found an ideal story length or a number that you usually find a drop off after? As Black and I can speak to that. Um, we tend to post some really, really long stories, and yes, we do get drop off um, per snap. So, as you can see in my example in the slides, um, there was, you know, a, there's about a 20,000 person drop off from beginning to end if you do more than like three or four slides. But um, we find it really useful to do a full story. So. Um, like I said, we've done one as long as 30 plus slides for Bohemian Rhapsody and people just kept egging us on and it was fun and it made a complete package. So we um, we try to stay within, you know, five to ten at the most, but occasionally we'll go way above that and, and just go crazy and have a lot of fun with it. And um, it doesn't matter so much that maybe not every single person watches the whole thing, but um, we measure by the first slide anyway, so um, the drop off doesn't really bother me. No. And something else to add to that, see, this is Allie again. Um, you know, I think Snapchat's interface also plays a role in your, your drop off because recently they released an update where um, you actually, when you finish someone's story, it automatically leads you into the next story, whereas before it would just end and you'd have to tap to start another story. So, you know, yeah. I would pay attention to things like that too. Again, I totally agree with Lucy that that drop-off doesn't really bother me. It's just a natural part of having a story that's more than a couple slides long. Um, but just keep in mind when you're when you're looking at your analytics and how many people are actually looking through. Sometimes I'll go through and just tap on stuff to get to the end of a story, so it's not on my feed anymore, <laughs> just because I'm really like anal retentive like that. Um, so again, you know, I really think while the analytics are important, but also looking at kind of you know whether people snap you back or they say they love your snaps or they're putting it on other social media channels, you know, it's, I would look at it holistically too, um, in addition to just sort of counting your views and, and screenshots. Well, this is Michael at the Georgia Museum of Art. I think that I look at it from the standpoint of, of me uh, digesting other people's stories and what is it that I like. And, and I actually find it satisfying to get to the end of a story, but I kind of want them to do the work for me and give me, those little snaps at the right duration. I think getting the rhythm right is really helpful. I don't necessarily enjoy it when I'm the one that's kind of pushing the process through. So sometimes I look at a story and I find that the still images are on there just way longer than I needed to absorb them. And I'm wondering, like, you know, am I the only one or am I impatient? I'm probably more patient than a lot of college students. So I think it's I think it's fun to try to build um, a story that people maybe will watch all the way to the end, but I think it's incumbent on you to figure out what is the right pacing for that that particular degree of uh, 
you know, information you're you're putting into those individual snaps that comprise the story. Yeah, and speaking to the length of snaps, this is Lucy. Um, we generally post still images at five seconds because we got a lot of responses at first um, when we were doing like one to three second snaps. People asking, please, please, please leave leave it up longer. I couldn't catch it. Da da da. And so um, I just assume that if people want to speed through it, they're tapping and they're going through the different snaps. But um, we tend to do five-second snaps um, in general. And then sometimes if I feel like the lyrics tend or lend towards a faster snap strategy, like I'll do five seconds, five seconds, five seconds, and then I'll do three that are like one second long just to try and get the tempo of it up. But um, in general, we go five seconds because we heard from our audience that that's what they prefer, and we stopped getting complaints after we um, uh, <laughs> increased it to five seconds. Um, and so I think we want to give people a chance to screenshot, too, so they can share. So I think that we found the sweet spot at five seconds. Well, thank you, Allie, Michael, Lucy, and Abraham. This was a great presentation. It was it was really awesome to hear how Snapchat can be used in different ways for different institutions. Um, so before we end the session, I just want to remind everyone that Snapchat will be having an International Museum Day live story and a geo filter on May 18th. So I hope everyone will be snapping at your museums that day. Um, while not everyone's story can be featured on the live story, um, what Snapchat has told me that they're really looking for is vertical video content. So that that will make it more likely for everyone. Um, I will, it seems like a lot of people are looking to follow everyone else's Snapchat. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, compile a list of all of our member museums and their Snapchats and then add it onto our muse Art Museum Day website. You can find that at bit.ly slash museum day 16. Um, it's also on amd.org's website. Um, so if you haven't already, just email me at syao at aamd.org or use the SurveyMonkey link on your screen on what your Snapchat handle is and what you'll be snapping on May 18th. This information is going to be given to Snapchat to make sure that they can open their geo fences at your location to allow you and your museum visitors to participate. Um, we'll have this webinar recording available by next week so that you can revisit all of the insights from our panelists. Unfortunately, we will not be making this deck available outside of that recording, um, just so you can have, because most people were talking and I want you to have the insight along with the deck. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for listening in, and I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Thank you, Stephanie.